So Brad asked me, oh, I hate it when people do that. I'm trying to correct my kids, and there I just did it. That's a real pet peeve I have, is starting off a conversation by saying, so, my apologies. <laughs> Business uptake. How are we doing? What is the reality of this from where I'm sitting at this point in time? And then I'm going to get into this, why we're doing this Gensler University thing. We have this program called LEAD. How many of you have heard of LEAD? Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It is a market-based program. The market out there is the only thing that causes this to happen. Our clients come to us and they either say, we want a LEED certified building or we don't. It really is brilliant in many ways. And at Gensler, we probably have done more LEED work than any other company in the world. And so I just checked to see what was the percentage of lead work that we're doing. And quite frankly, I'm surprised. This is really a good number. Of the work that we do that could potentially go after lead certification, we now have about 35 to 40 percent of our work is in some phase of lead work. It's pursuing lead certification or it is lead certified. That's actually a pretty good news. I thought it was running in the range of 5 to 10 percent. That's probably where we were at about two years ago. However, we do a lot of work that isn't applicable to LEED. And more importantly, LEED does not mean sustainable. LEED is a system that we gain to get points. LEED actually takes our eye off the ball. LEAD keeps our people from learning about sustainability and has them focusing on learning about a system to game to get points. Now, I don't want to be too critical because it's doing some good things and it's making many of our people more aware than they would have been otherwise, but it is the opposite of becoming whole systems thinkers. And yet we're being driven by all of these different distinct little systems which are causing us to respond to them. So it's making our life much, much more difficult. But this, I think, is the key. And I'm so glad that Chris is still here because this is the essence. Now, and I loved one of his quotes, and I don't remember which one it was. I could go back to and look at it. But one of the flaws we have right off the bat is that we think that the computer is here. This is our brain, right? Wrong. I don't, I don't know where we're at on this, Chris, but my understanding is we not only have neural cells sitting up here, we've got them in our heart. That's why we speak from our heart. We've got them in our gut. That's why we talk about a gut reaction. So the very way in which we have learned to think about who we are now, the metaphors that we have up and running in our brains, are the very things that we have to break through to really get after the essence of this. And I want to read you a quote. And I don't read quotes very often. But I think this one really goes to a lot of the issues that we've been hitting on in different ways. And the question that sort of led to this, this response, sort of the notion is, why the acceptance, why the drop in the acceptance of climate change from 71% who believed in climate change in 2007 down to 51% that believed in climate change in 2009 and now, in 2012, only 41% of the U.S. population believe that climate change is real and is caused by man. A 30% drop. Why? And in response to that, here's, here's, here's a response. The Yale Cultural Cognition Project has looked at cultural worldview and climate change. And what's clear is that ideology is the main factor in whether you believe in climate change. If you have an egalitarian and communitarian worldview, and if you tend towards a belief system of pooling resources and helping the less advantaged, then you believe in climate change. And the stronger your belief system tends towards a hierarchical or individual worldview, the greater the chances are that you deny climate change and the stronger your denial will be. The reason is clear. 
It's because people protect their worldview. We all do this. We develop intellectual antibodies. Climate change confirms what people on the left already believe, but the left must take this confirmation responsibly. It means that if you are on the left of the spectrum, you need to guard against exaggeration and your own tendency to unquestionably accept the data because it confirms your worldview. So this thing that we have up here can change its mind in an instant if the right forces are at play. But for the most part, we start out, we create a meaningful view of the world when we're young, and then we spend the rest of our lives filtering information to protect it. And I think that that is the biggest challenge. And that is one of the biggest challenges that I face within my organization. And that takes me to the story, which really began with Doc. How are we going to make change at Gensler? And what inspired me with Doc's book on compression and the part that I took to heart and that I acted upon was the notion of a vigorous learning enterprise. So I began with this idea that we couldn't do it ourselves and we needed to team up with another organization. And I went out to a software vendor, a software vendor that not only developed software, they actually contained expertise. And they needed to learn more about us as architects and we needed to learn more about their software and we needed to learn together. Now, I did not entirely accomplish all of my objectives because I'm sure, as many of you know, as the project grew from myself to include others, there were other objectives that began to come into play. But the core of it held true. So, now oh, there I go again. They have had an influence on me. We began with learning objectives. One of the amazing partners that came in to work with me on this was our firm-wide coordinator of learning, a woman by the name of Jeanine Pesci. She's an adherent to Noel Titchy's action learning program. The issue is not having gurus up on the stage, sorry. The issue is about putting people into a position where they are learning and they are learning powerfully from learning experiences. And so we really made an effort to try and do that within this program. And we began with these learning goals that we have in mind. And they're very complex, ranging from how do you impact the work of 3,000 design professionals? How do you get people to see design in a new way? We, we really complicated our process. It's a complex question. We decided that in order to impact the work of 3,000 people, we had to look at four very broad practice areas that we're engaged in. We needed to be able to reach inside of our organization to affect change with four very different audiences. We wanted to work all around the world in distinct climates with, with some end goals of, of really fundamentally redesigning our design process so that we could deliver net zero buildings. Big ambitious goals. In order to accomplish that, and this is just one of three programs we've got up and running now, although this is the biggest, we started out with who should be involved with this. Now we have a program up and running with our next generation leadership because our biggest challenge is how do we grow leadership. We have another program running from a research and development point of view looking at how we bring lean thinking into this. And then this is the leadership change program. So we went out to the 400 leaders that are running this firm and we asked them to submit applications. We went through a review process and out of that we picked 24 people to participate. And the good news is it's a broad range of people. We worked hard to make sure we got participation from Asia. We worked hard to make sure we had young people. And we got people that are just one or two years away from retiring. We set them up in a program where we would have a live learning event in Los Angeles, followed by one month of offline where they had to learn together. We've just brought them back together in Houston for an intensive workshop. They're now engaged in a two-month program and we're meeting in Washington, D.C. for an executive symposium where they will be presenting their results to the executive leadership of Gensler. And then we'll be developing the action implementation plans that take us into the August Board of Directors meeting to then take this thing out and scale it up across the world. We had some 
interesting goals, an innovative, scalable bioclimatic design process, and to qualify as innovative, it had to be simpler, faster, and less costly than the existing methods that we're using, which are just tearing us apart because of all of these thousands of tools that Sergey was, was referencing in terms of the, the cookbook that we've got out there. And more importantly, and this goes to the other diagram, we're trying to create a new kind of a professional. We're trying to get out of the box of just being designers. We're trying to complement the left and the right brain the metrics, the performance, the science-based thinking with the creative, the intuitive. And then it comes down to a very simple, we want to develop a sustainable design process innovation and to lead the implementation of this process in our practice. The pre-work involved each of the teams had to select a Gensler project that was accomplished and is built right now it could not be a lead project. It just needed to be run-of-the-mill average work. What is it that we do all of the time and deliver to our clients? And how then, in that context, we took the living building challenge, which is the most aggressive, sustainable design challenge in our space. The living building challenge includes net zero. It includes water independence. It includes getting rid of the red list of materials. It includes biophilia. At this point in time, I think there are only two or three buildings that have achieved the living building challenge. And you don't achieve the living building challenge until the building has been up and operating for one year and you can prove it. You don't achieve it through simulation. You don't achieve it through gaming games, game points. You achieve it with a real living building that's up and running. A huge challenge for us. I mean, we spoke about what's practical, what's reasonable. We're trying to achieve the AIA 2030 goals, which are just to reduce um, carbon out of our buildings by 2030. It's incredibly difficult, and we're tracking those metrics. We know how far we've got to go. So this is the team, and this is where we're at right now. These are the individuals that ultimately have to pull this together. We have a planning team with a sponsor, with a project. This particular project is a campus in China. We've already built the campus, and we're asking now in this context, how would we have done it differently, and what is the planning process that enables that? We have an architecture team looking at a very classic corporate headquarters, the kind of thing we do all the time. How would we turn that into a living building challenge? What is the process? How would it have to be different? And bear in mind, there's a relationship between planning and architecture. And then the huge challenge for us, now they've got, they're all huge challenges, 40% of our work is in the interiors, where we don't have control over the envelope. And interiors is what we're churning through all the time. So this sort of comes back to this big question about life cycle assessment and really long-term big thinking. I mean, we're, we're cranking people in and out of buildings, changing spaces day in and day out, and the climate that we're sitting in is the HVAC systems that are already in the building. We have very little that we can do, and yet there's so much. It's such an important place for us to do this work. And then rollout. And rollout is rollout. I mean, rollout is almost the an 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 anathema to sustainability. Is how do you take a corporate program, and it could be Yummy Foods, it could be Bank of America, it could be General Motors revitalization of d dealerships across the country. And how do you take and roll that out across the world very quickly with a standard brand program, with a standard set of construction details, when you're going into a different culture, you're going into a different climate, you're going into a different set of building materials and building capabilities in terms of the tools and the trades. So these are the big questions that we're asking ourselves. So where are we at? We've had the meeting in Los Angeles. That was the first meeting. And here's the tough part. It's not just about sustainability. We had all of these complex things that we're looking at in sustainability from a bioclimate, net zero simulation point of view. It's very much about leadership. And so half of this program is about enabling these people not only to be, help them articulate a design process, but to then to be able to go out and to have a teachable point of view about that design process, to be able to communicate about that design process to the rest of their staff, to the rest of their 
regions so that we can ignite this kind of change. And more recently, we've met in Houston. And the challenges there then moved us into this world of biophilia, health. We've been talking about health, the red list materials, sight, water, huge topics. I mean, each of these topics themselves could have been 10, 20 day live learning programs. <laughs> and here you see people, for example, I mean, this is, this is the kind of workshop environment that we're in. You can see people charting their journey lines, and I can assure you that when this group of individuals came back together in Houston, their journey line was sort of like this. It's like, oh my God, we've got to figure this out, and then we're supposed to present it to the board of directors in Washington, D.C. in two months. What the hell did you get me into here? But the really wonderful thing is, is that when you stress people out like that and you take them out of their comfort zone, that's where the real learning happens. So unfortunately, you're going to have to wait till next year to hear it out, how it all actually turns out. And, and next year is just the beginning because we know that this is not going to stop with this. It will have to integrate the research efforts from the other two programs. We're going to have to go out into the field with it, learn our mistakes, and continue to apply it. So the next meeting is in August where we meet with the management committee. We put together the implementation plan, and then the goal is to scale it up worldwide. All because of this one little meme in Doc's book on the virtual learning enterprise. Thank you, Doc. Any questions on this? Oh, come on. There's got to be some question out there. You guys, you guys need to stand up and breathe. Let's go back to uh how you started the presentation. Um, one of, to me, one of the important criteria in doing this successfully is a deep sense of intellectual objectivity. You use the term climate change about 10 times. Only once out of the 10 times did you say human caused climate change. Okay. There are two aspects of climate change. There's the cyclical and the human cause. There are people that fall over a whole spectrum of what percent is cyclical and what percent is human cause. We've got to be intellectually objective when we present these environmental and sustainable issues. And therein lies the real challenge of what I'm facing trying to create this program inside of the world's largest design firm that serves a clientele that most likely leans towards the side of the spectrum where their ideological beliefs are going to put them into a position where they're not likely to believe in this. And yet, I, I, I really hope I'm wrong on this. And this is, and I try to go out and look critically and listen to people that will tell me that there's a different point of view and I'm really looking for it. I know I'm a human being and I know I'm biased. My worry is the risk. My worry is the vulnerability. My worry is that we have this beautiful climate system which has been relatively stable over the last 10,000 years that it has enabled human culture to emerge around this planet, and that there's a slow-moving variable that we're now tracking. We know it pretty well, and the science of greenhouse gases is really well understood. And there's this variable out there, and there are these greenhouse gases, and we're watching it, and it's raising year by year. We know the major source of that is the hydrocarbons, all right? And we've gotten really good at getting that stuff out of the ground and putting it up into the atmosphere, and it's raising. And so the real question is the risk. And I don't know the risk, but this is my worry. And my daughter's here, and she's got this belly right now. I'm about to become a grandpa. My worry is that there's this system out there which is currently in a stability regime, and there's a variable out there, and it's rolling around, and it's got this basin of attraction. And there's a risk that we could flip this climate into a different stability regime. And it may not be one that is conducive 
to human health or life? Might be. We may not be able to control it, and, and we may not be able to engineer our way back out of it. Excuse me? Could not. I'm not, I'm not sure that I'm tracking with you, but, but I'll come back to you, and you'll be free to ask another question. So that's my worry, and you're absolutely right. So, so, the, so ultimately it comes down to how do we frame the issues? How do we reach out to people? And I have to be very careful of that because clearly I have my biases. I'm so far to the left, I've actually begun to come back around to the right. Yeah. Actually. You're absolutely right. And you know where I come from? We're looking forward to some of those benefits. We want to have a little less rain. The wine growers in the Columbia River Valley are really happy because their climate for wine and grapes is really getting better. And Napa's a little worried. So, and that's an interesting one because we, we might use less fuel for heating our homes, but in all these big buildings that are internally load-dominated, the actual cooling requirements are going up. And we're looking at that as we're putting these buildings in place and looking at what are the potential risks. Because passive, passive buildings, passive buildings is this issue of trying to use natural resources of sun, wind, light, water first to minimize the systems that we have in buildings. These are finely tuned buildings. They are incredibly subject to these changes, slight changes in climate. And the issue isn't, for example, in looking at 2020 and 2030 climate in the UK, the issue isn't necessarily that it's one or two degrees or five degrees hotter on the, on the extreme day. The issue is that over 200, day, over 200 days, it's on an average of a degree or two degrees hotter, which has the huge impact on energy. So it's complicated. Oh, is that the right thing to say? <laughs> it's complicated. And you're right. The, objective, the question about objectivity is really important. And the question of how to frame it and speak about it is something I'm still trying to figure out. We have, hang on. Well, and that's a question because that goes to the quote. Do we listen to science or is it really our ideological view that's driving us? That could be. Question back here. Who else did you go see before you started this? You said you had a partner in a software firm. Who else did you go see? Not a whole lot of people. And you may be fishing for something and you may have some advice to give me. But I was, I was really looking at trying to join us up with some collaborating partners. So as a design firm, what we wanted to do was to really have a top-notch building science software simulation company with us. We wanted to have a, a, so the best um, engineers that were available to us. So it was really, we were really looking at coupling up the architecture and the engineering side to look at those joint systems together. Did you have a, another recommendation? Well, we saw on one of the slides earlier, um, uh, I can't remember which one since there's been just a plethora. Um, we saw things like, we saw things like Theory U. We saw things like go out and see in a lean context. Usually on a, before you would start a journey like this, you would go see somebody else. And I was wondering if, who else that was and how much time you took in that. Or you, you're taking it from, um, you already have the confidence to, to feel like this major effort was appropriate without having gone out on a learning journey beforehand. We could have done more of that. And I think the one, the one big aspect of that that was part of our learning journey was really looking at the living building challenge and the two buildings that are out there right now. There, one's in construction in Seattle, one's still on drawing boards in Portland, Oregon, which are currently on track to be the largest living building challenges in the world. And we're talking large. We're talking six stories in Seattle. That's how big, that's the biggest living building challenge we figured out how to get, six stories in Seattle. In, in Portland, we're trying to get one up to, I think it's at eight stories right now. The parameters, the limits that we're under when we're trying to meet this living building challenge drive these projects down in size. 
That's why in Europe, before fossil fuels, most buildings are six, seven stories. These buildings we're putting up right now, they can't exist without fossil fuels. These buildings that we're in right now in Shanghai, in Hong Kong, in Houston, in London, that are 20, 30, 40, 60, 80 stories tall, they're death zones in 50 or 80 years from now. They're dead zones without a lot of energy. Precisely. Precisely. Um, let's get one from you. Um, I'm curious about what you see. So you're working to develop a, a design process, and I'm curious for what you see um, the future of that process being. So once you have it, do you imagine it being a, a new standard, like, you know, a lead 2.0, like the next way of saying, this is, a, this is a very sustainable building, or do you, um, do you see the development of a sustainable design process uh, being more something that you incorporate into every project that you do, no matter if the client asks for, um, for a more sustainable option or not? The answer is the latter. We believe that this is a moral objective, and when I say we, we are a company that's all over the spectrum also. And a key part of this is we getting after some of our own values. So I don't necessarily speak the, 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 the narrative of the company as a whole, but I speak the narrative of an emerging group of individuals that are leaders within the, the organization. And in many ways, we're looking at the narrative that's of the next generation of leaders that are coming up. And it's not about creating the standard. It's in many ways just recognizing that we are a business and our business is design process and design process is continually evolving. It will evolve on every project and every project has a unique design process and we're trying to inform what that, how that design process can learn from itself and continue to grow and feed on this sustainability idea. We understand that the challenge that this group has right now is they're trying to design a new design process when we don't yet know how to design the end thing that we're trying to design. So we're trying to design a design process to get something that's higher performing than we already know how to do. So it is going to be a continual virtuous learning cycle that we're going to be going through for the rest of our lives, all of us. That's our professional challenge. It's a very good question. One last question, and then I'm going to have to take it in another direction. I'm, I'm sorry, but let's go back to you. You haven't had one yet. You know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, we have to move people emotionally or with data, and there's like two different camps of thinking out there. And it just seems to me there's a lot of stuff that's been said about, you know, if we're really going to move people, it has to start emotionally, right? You've got you to push that button that resonates with somebody, you know, here. And the data is kind of a follow-on. It, it gives them the ability to rationalize, okay, yeah, you, you've convinced me, you know, that this is a good thing to do because it feels right. Now there's some data there that I can use to point to to help me rationalize it that position to myself and to other people, but it has to start with emotions. Well, I tend to agree with you, and I, and I think, and Chris spoke to this earlier, fear motivates people, and I struggle with this. Fear is what motivates me, and maybe also a frustration with the way things are now and a, and a, and a, a belief that there actually can be a better life, that we can live a higher quality life, that it isn't just about having more stuff. Just on that, though, different people have different buttons or different emotions that you have to leverage, right? So for you and for some people, it's, it's fear. For other people, it might be something else, a, a sense of security or, or, you know, build up their confidence in some way or, or a sense of, you know, better understanding. Whatever it is, it's important to that individual or that group. But again, it's different for different, you know. Precisely. So you have to know the audience and you have to use the audience language. With you, I took a little bit of a liberty and went out a little bit took a couple of extra steps that I might not take in other circumstances. Chris, I would like any comments or questions. In any way taking sides one way or the other on uh, the issue of climate change in general and human uh, caused climate change in particular, those of you who are interested in following the debate might want to know that there's an interesting interchange ongoing in the New York Review of Books and also in uh, the Wall Street Journal um, by uh, William Nordhaus on one side and a collection of uh, very reputable scientists led by Will Happer on the other. Happer is a physicist at Princeton, uh, former uh, Office of Science Director at, uh, at the 
U.S. Department of Energy, head of the Jasons, um, a uh, high-powered science advisory group to the U.S. government. Um, that's as good an interchange as you're going to find by principled uh, people. There are no crazies in that debate, and you will find all sides represented. Excellent. Now, I have the mic. I'm in control of the agenda. You guys might have to take the mic away from me. I'm, I'll take one more question or comment on this, and this gentleman we haven't heard from before. Hi, Ken. Thanks. Um, so I, I'm curious from a process perspective, and I, I should disclose I'm Dave Lebuskis with RTKL, so we're in a very similar uh, path as Gensler is. You, you formulated the – so I, the way I see this is sort of two phases. The phase you're under now is discovery, and the new – the phase that you're going to be in after August is change. And your formulation of the group for discovery was self-selected um, by uh, application. So you don't have any skeptics in the room, probably. You probably don't have of the 400 members of the leadership group that apply or that were able to apply – you have selected 24 people. Probably not a lot of the 24 people in the room walked in saying, everything's good. We don't need to change anything. We're making plenty of money. We're the number one design group in the world. They're in the room expecting change and wanting change. I'm not sure that's the same representative body as the June meeting or the August meeting. And it was almost assuredly not the same group of people that will need to change following August. I'm wondering what portion of your discussions, your processes are incorporating those thoughts and how you're preparing for that in the implementation phase. Oh, that's a great question. That's really a good one. And part of it is the fact that we have three programs up and running right now. I described to you our Gensler University program. We have a next generation program and, and that's one where re we're really aggressive on that, where we're, we're taking people that are under 40, and they're the future leaders of the firm. And we've tasked them with a very similar issue. They're looking at it from a different point of view, and they are looking directly at this issue of values, and they are pushing directly on the board of directors. Gensler is unique in its board of directors in that it's shared by three people, David, Andy, and Diane. And those three people have three different views on this very issue, and that is the group that will be presented to in Washington, D.C. And you were right, this was largely a self-selecting group, and myself and my, and my fellow sustainable design leaders were selecting for those people, and yet within this group we have across the spectrum, because we've got people coming from Shanghai, we've got people coming from Houston, we've got people coming from Washington, D.C., we've got people coming from San Francisco. They all have different takes on it. And the really interesting thing is the executive sponsorship in particular has a much more conservative view, and they are at the, at the head of the table. And so we're having some pretty interesting conversations, I can assure you. But you know what is, and I'll conclude with this thought, what is really the most powerful part about this and the investment that we're making, and, and this is bad from a carbon point of view, and we've got all the technology out there, the video conferencing, you know, you name it, we've got it. The power of this program is flying people together and putting them together in the same room getting them face-to-face -face and building those relationships. Because it's when you can sidle up to someone, and I love that word, who has a different point of view from you and establish something that's in common that you get this trust, which then enables you to take on the more complicated question where you don't necessarily agree. So that's a really good observation, and it's a challenge. So with that, again, I've got the mic, but I'm going to stop myself.